be talking a little bit more about creation cosmology in Genesis and elsewhere in the Old Testament because it goes hand in glove with Genesis and really talking about creation worldview. And, and I mean, I'll be honest with you, in this one, I'm, I'm going to be in a, in a good way, a little chippier, because I, I, I want you to, to get a feel for the importance of really sort of thinking clearly about what it is you believe and then making a decision to really stand there, even if it gets uncomfortable. And I know, again, because I've, you know, I've done presentations on these topics before that uh, not all of you are, are going to agree with my take on things, and I want you to know that's fine. After enough years of teaching, you get used to people looking at you like you got two heads anyway. So that's okay. It, it's kind of what makes it interesting for, for the person on this end of the, the conversation. And, you know, don't, don't feel like you can't, you know, ask me something that uh, would telegraph that. Yes, ask, ask what you want. I mean, that, that's why I'm here. Um, but I want you to know that. But I, I also want to challenge you because a lot of times we, uh, as evangelicals, as Christians, whatever label you want to stick on yourself, you know, we, we, we say we believe X, Y, Z. And sometimes my question is, if I was in a classroom, I would say, well, do you really? We believe the Bible is the literal word of God. Do you really? You know, where does your literalism end? You know, and where does somebody else's begin? And that always factors into something like this topic for Genesis. And I'm going to show you tonight, I'm going to be a flaming, uncompromising, blind literalist tonight. And I'm going to challenge you to be as literal as I am. Now you're probably wondering, what is, where is he angling toward? You know, you'll find out. I also have a little gadget tonight. I couldn't wait to get here because I just got this this week, so I'm going to try not to mess it up. But, ah, look at that. <laughs> it worked <laughs> once. How should we interpret the Bible? Let's use this as our starting point. And I've taken some of this information from the source at the bottom there, L. Wells Dictionary. We like to say that we believe in literal interpretation or grammatical historical exegesis, which is defined by L. Well like this. Each biblical document, each part of a biblical document must be studied in its context. I mean, we've all heard that before. Keep things in context, let scripture interpret scripture, very normal. Both its immediate literary context and the wider situation in which it appeared. This calls for an understanding of the following elements. We should study the original languages. Okay? We should pay attention to the type of literature that our particular passage is in and part of. And in, in literary terms, what sort of genre or literature context it is. For instance, you have parables, you have psalms, you have poetry and non-poetry. You've got prophecy and proverbs. They're not all the same. I mean, it just depends what what the literary context is. And we're taught to pay attention to the historical circumstances, the geographical circumstances, and lastly, the life setting. Now, does any of that seem objectionable? It seems pretty normal to me. When we say we practice this kind of interpretation, we are supposedly saying, and I'm going to ask how serious we are about it, that we need to contextualize the Bible in its original context as best we can and then go from there. Now, what that means is this. And this, to me, these are obvious things. I think they'll be obvious to you, but they might feel a little uncomfortable. If you're going to affirm grammatical, historical interpretation then you can't affirm certain things. The context for understanding Genesis is not the Roman Catholic Church. Now, I bring the Catholic Church into this because they've been the dominant group historically. They have their own teaching magisterium. In other words, that, that guides the interpretation of the church, a select group of individuals. And in a broad Christian audience, they are in large part what we think of as church tradition, whether we like Catholicism or not, whether we agree with its doctrines or not. They've molded tradition. 
But that isn't the context for the Bible or for Genesis. Neither is the Protestant Reformation. Luther and Calvin were wonderful men used by God. They are not the context for Genesis. They are quite far removed from Genesis. Okay, so you, we can refer to them, see what they, they said, but their decisions on things should not be considered binding in any way because they're just divorced from the context. Now, they might have insight into the context. That's why you read these guys. But the problem with the Catholic Church, Protestant Reformation, and everything else I'm going to put up here is that because of historical circumstances, they lacked a lot of information that we are fortunate enough, really burdened with today. All this stuff we think about compared to material like Egyptian sites and archaeology and language and Mesopotamia and the surrounding you know, nations of, of Canaan, all these languages and that give us insight into cultural customs and religion and history. They had zero. They had none of that. Because it wasn't deciphered until the late 1800s. Some of it wasn't even discovered until the 20th century. They had nothing like that. They're just winging it. Okay? And that's you know through no problem with their own scholarship. It's just their context. It's quite different. 20th and 21st century evangelicalism is, always, is also not the context for Genesis. We're even further removed. Okay, we have opinions because we are, we've been, our, our thinking about Genesis has been historically conditioned by this, the things we have to deal with. Things like, I'll put this next one up, post-Darwinistic Christianity. The church has had to deal with Darwin. Okay? 18, you know, mid-19th century, we have Darwin and his influence going on in the 20th century, of course. You know, it's still you know, a, a dominant idea in the scientific community and you know, other, other areas as well. But the fact that we have to fight with Darwinism or that we want to fight with Darwinism or we feel we ought to fight with Darwinism has nothing to do with the context of Genesis. The writer of Genesis had... He'd never heard of Darwin. I mean, that's kind of dumb to say that because, well, you know, he lives in the 1800s. Of course they never heard of Darwin. They'd never come, come across his ideas. So they're not, what, what's in Genesis is not a response to Darwin. Darwin wasn't around. It's not the context for Genesis. The context for understanding Genesis is the historical, religious, literary, and quote-unquote scientific context as, as much as you could use that term, it was the context in which it was written. That is its context. None of these other ones. Some more things. A little less obvious, but did you, do you realize God did not create a new culture for Israel that was foreign to the rest of the world at the time when God comes to Moses or you know, whichever other biblical figure and says, you know, most of the time God doesn't say, hey, write this down. Okay, that's, that's actually very rare in the Old Testament when you have any sort of, hey, you, start writing. Um, but when God moves people to record something that God knows, and maybe they knew, would wind up in a collection that was considered sacred, the Bible, God doesn't say to himself first, boy, you know, you know, I'd, I'd really like to tell them about how I made everything. But how do I do that? I mean, I, I've, got to, I've got to change the way they think. I've got to give them more information so that when I really give them the scientific details, they'll understand it. And not only that, but I have another problem. You know, God says to himself in this imaginary conversation, even if I take the writer and make him super normal, super human, that I advance his brain, when I fill his brain with all this post-Darwinistic, because I know this guy Darwin's coming along. If I fill his brain with that and enable him to write in such a way that it will encompass and critique Darwin before Darwin's ever born, how is what he's writing going to be at all coherent to the people who read it, the people that I haven't advance their brain. Okay, now that might seem like a trite description, 
But it's important. God doesn't change the writer and the original audience. He doesn't advance them scientifically to be able to produce a document that would have advanced scientific knowledge and description. He doesn't bother. Frankly, I'm of the opinion that if God came back today, if we didn't have a Bible and God said, hey, you know, it's 21st century, I need to start uh, taking these humans and having them write some things down. They're pretty good writers now, lots of different languages. So let's have them write some things down. I need a really smart guy to talk about creation. Hey, well, let's, let's grab Stephen Hawking over there and have a conversation. It's still a waste of God's time. Because if God really told him all the details, it would be beyond Stephen Hawking's comprehension. Now, he might comprehend a little bit more than you know, the producers of the Old Testament, but God is still so far in advance of Stephen Hawking, whether Stephen Hawking likes to admit that or not, uh, that it would really be a waste of God's time. God, could, God is perfectly capable of telling us exactly, with great precision, how everything worked at the beginning, how it was done. He's capable of communicating that. The conversation would be lost on us because our brains are just too puny. It's just, we're human, he's not. God also does not bother to change Israel's worldview. Okay, I don't need to give you a scientific advantage, but I do need to correct some things about your culture that I really don't like, that don't seem really fair or, or pardon the expression, kosher. I really need to change a few things, and then I'll give you the Torah and those things that could be potentially objectionable down the line, eons and millennia from now, will be weeded out. Things like in the Old Testament law that women could not inherit property. Okay, that's in there. They're not, because that's, that's a patriarchal culture. That's what the world of the Old Testament is. It's a patriarchal culture. God doesn't change the culture, clean it up first, and then say, now we can talk. He comes to people as they are, knowing what they know or what they don't know, and says, let's get something down here that you can understand. Not only that you can understand, but that the people who read what you're going to produce, they'll understand it too. Because it's communicated in their language, in their worldview. They'll get it. Because I, as God, am choosing to come to this place at this time in history, to these people. That's God's decision. And now I'm going to start revealing who I am. God doesn't bother to, to clean up anybody's act. And that if we just realize that, there are a lot of things in the Old Testament that unbelievers object to that you can really file under, why are you being critical of, of a document where, you know, the Old Testament doesn't necessarily approve of a lot of these things. They just are, because that was their culture. They just are. So why, you know, get apoplectic over it? God's revelation to Israel needed to be culturally decipherable. They had to get it. They had to understand it. It also had to be culturally consistent. In other words, God couldn't fill the Old Testament with things that were foreign to the culture to whom he was communicating, or else they would go, what? What's up with that? I don't, I don't understand any of it. This is supposed to be a revelation from God? Well, doesn't God know who I am? I don't get this stuff. No, in their original context, they, they get it. Because he, again, is choosing the time, the place, the circumstance, the people to communicate something to. Now, how many of these things do you believe? Let me just give you a list without commentary here, or much commentary. Yes, I know the terms are subject to definition, but work with me, people, okay? <laughs> Inspiration and inerrancy. People want to quibble about what do you mean, what do you don't mean. Just take the terms, okay? Would you affirm them or not? Would you affirm the idea that God communicated through people just as where they were? In other words, God acts in time. See, we're very fond of talking about how God acts in time with people when it makes us, you know, when it's in the context of God loving us and saving us and providing atonement. It's the same thing when God decides to give us revelation. He's acting in time, specific time, specific place. Do you believe that general revelation, which is nature, creation, 
and special revelation, the Bible, are equally true? Do you believe that there's only one source for everything that is true? Now consider the alternative. No, I think there are two sources for everything that's true, or ten. Really? Okay, well, I wonder if those sources ever disagree. and I wonder why there would be more than one. Can any of them ever be more true than any of the other ones? I mean, you, you start to get into these kind of weird debates. This was actually a debate in church history, you know, the difference between Eastern Orthodox and you know, now Catholicism, the East and West Church. One of their fundamental disagreements was, did the Spirit proceed from the Father or the Father and the Son? And you think, well, who cares? Well, they cared. And 1,500 years later, they're still caring, okay? I mean, this was a split in Christianity because the one side said there is only one source of truth, and that is God the Father, not two, one. The other side said, well, let's throw Jesus in there, too. I mean, he's God, isn't he? Well, yeah, he's God, but everything begins with the Father. The Father was deemed hierarchically supreme to the Son. And they fought over that, and they split. And now that's why we have Eastern Orthodoxy, there are other reasons, and the West. But do you believe fundamentally that everything that's really true is equally true? If you think about that, how can something be more true than true? That means that the thing that's less true might have a little bit of error in it. Okay? You, and you don't want to go there. <laughs> Do you believe that divine accommodation is necessary? In other words, do you believe that God had to make, you know, God had to sort of lower himself to be able to communicate to human beings, that we're just we're beneath his level of his capacity, and he has to stoop a little bit to make things known to us? Do you believe that there's total object, or that total objectivity in science is a myth? Okay, think about that one. Total objectivity in science is a myth. Do you believe that? Or are scientists the only completely objective individuals on the planet? You know, never, nothing in their background can penetrate their skull and influence them in the slightest way. They're completely objective. I would say that they're not human if they you know, want to claim that. Do you believe that current evolutionary theory has serious problems? In other words, do you believe that there's actually still debate, even within the evolutionary community, about evolution? There is. You don't have to read very far to, to find that out. Do you believe that you are under no obligation to make the Bible palatable to science? Now, I'm going to tell you where I'm at. I believe all of those things. Every one of them. And if you think about the list, they sort of create ramifications for each other in certain ways. You don't have to give me an answer, but I want you to think about it. Do you believe some or all of these things? Now, since I do believe all of these things, I, I, I think that it is a myth that science scientists can claim to be totally objective. It's about gathering data, but all data is filtered through something that we call presuppositions, we call our experience, we call our outlook, we call our worldview. It's just part of being human. And we're not robots. We are influenced by things. Given all that, I would say there is no need to bend science to the Bible because I think the natural, what is true in the natural world is equally true to what's in the Bible. Okay, I don't, I don't think they're two different truths. I think if it's true, it's equally true, and it comes from the same place. Okay, So I don't see the necessity of bending one to the other. And the flip side is, I don't see any need to bend the Bible to science either. You say, how in the world does that work? How does that work? I said this last week, by just letting the Bible be what it is. Nothing more, nothing less, even if it hurts. 
<laughs> All right, even if, even if that leaves you with the feeling that, oh, you know, I, I want it to do something for me here in this argument. But to do that, I need to make it something that it's not, but it'll feel good. I'll win, that. I'll win the point. I'll win the argument. Yeah, I'm going to challenge you to resist that. And I, let me illustrate it for you. Six-year-old girl. God made my baby brother. A scientist comes along and says, no, he didn't. Your mommy and daddy did. Who's right? Who is right? Now I am going to ask for hands. <laughs> Who's right? How many says the six-year-old girl? So you're going to cheat now. How many says the scientist? <laughs> Okay, both. How many say both? Who's wrong? Is he wrong? Is the scientist wrong to say that God didn't make your baby brother? How many would say, yeah, they're both right, but the scientist is wrong too? Is the six-year-old girl wrong? They're both right, and they're both wrong. But why can we look at that and up here parse that successfully? Why does the fact that they're both right and both wrong not bother us at all? <laughs> because we understand what the claim of the six-year-old girl is really about. We understand that she's six, okay? I mean, we, we look at the situation and we have an immediate context for it. We say, yeah, yeah, you're, you're right. But we know that scientifically, no, not every birth happens like Jesus, the Holy Spirit coming upon Mary and poof, she's pregnant. Okay, not everything happens that way. That's why it was unique. That's why it was a miracle. Mommies and daddies do make babies. Okay? So they're both right. They're both wrong. But we understand intuitively because we have a feel for the cultural situation. All the factors, the age, sort of the silliness about the scientist objecting to a six-year-old. Like, what kind of an ego does it take to do that? We, we get it. We know what the six-year-old's trying to say. So here are my propositions. We're going to come back to the six-year-old, the scientist. They're going to go at it again tonight. <laughs> Someone's framework for reality may be flawed by imprecision, like the six-year-old's, due to lack of understanding, but their truth can't claim can still be quite correct. See, ultimately, God is responsible for all life isn't he? God really is responsible for her baby brother. Because without God, she wouldn't have had a mommy and daddy, and there'd be no baby brother. We wouldn't be talking about babies. But her, her perception of what that involves is flawed because she's six. Okay? Even though it's flawed, what she's really getting at is true. Correct. The Bible's worldview might be pre-scientific in some respects. God didn't bother to change that. But its truth claims are still correct. Okay, that's actually my position in all this. I don't really care. And I'm going to show you some examples. If the Bible doesn't even if there's no biblical Hebrew word for brain, okay, and there isn't, and the Bible links the seat of emotions and intellect and will to your stomach or your kidneys or whatever, you know, it could link it to your big toe for all I care. I don't really care. 
Because when I read those passages, I know what the writer's trying to say. It gave me heebie-jeebies or something like, okay, I, I know what's being communicated. And it's being communicated accurately in that context. And I'm not troubled by the context because I understand it. The same way I'm not troubled by the six-year-old girl who says, God made my baby brother. You're right. He did. So I would charge the critic, again, this I've said before, it's dishonest to criticize Genesis for not being what it wasn't intended to be. Okay, if you want to have a debate with me, you're going to have to justify the incoherence of your beginning position, and then we can have that conversation. Good luck with that. Six-year-old girl. Okay, round two. <laughs> God made my baby brother scientist. No, he didn't. Your mommy and daddy did. Six-year-old girl comes back. No, really, he did. Scientist. You're stupid. I'm going to expose your ignorance to my academic colleagues. Can you imagine how absurd that would be? I'm going to go right out to my professional society and I'm going to submit a paper on how ignorant this six-year-old girl is. I'm going to expose her flawed thinking. Yeah! Yeah, why don't you just give her a backflip while you're out? <laughs> you know, off the top rope into the turnbuckle kind of thing. You know, it's just ridiculous, but I put this here for a point. This is how I view the critic. Well, the Bible doesn't know there's nine planets, or the Bible says there's a round, flat Earth. Yeah. Okay. That's because God didn't bother to change who they were when he said something. Okay, is there any problem with, you know, you go through the whole thing of purpose. It's really about, do you believe there's a God or not? And if you do, can he actually do anything? And then, he's, you know, for him to come back and say, and still go after it, I'm going to expose the fact that it, it, I'm mad at it for not being what it wasn't supposed to be to all my colleagues. Good luck with that. They're going to look at you like you're an idiot because what you just said sounds idiotic. It's like complaining to your scientific colleagues that your dog isn't a cat. Okay? It, it just doesn't make any sense. It's incoherent. It's, it's a dumb way to argue because you're trying, again, to criticize something for not being what it never was intended to be. So I would suggest to the believer, it's unwise to make Genesis something it isn't to protect it from the critic. Folks, it's the word of God. It doesn't need you to protect it. I know that hurts because I've said that to myself. <laughs> I know that that just sort of chops you down a little bit. But it's true. It doesn't need to be protected. It will still be here long after we're all gone. And the new round of people will be there to criticize it afresh. And after they're gone, it'll still be there. It doesn't need you, even though we, we really want to, to do that. Because when you do that, it only makes the critic think that their criticism is valid. It fails to call them on the carpet for their own dishonesty. In other words, if you accept the way they frame the argument, they're never going to learn how dumb their position is. Because you're going to keep it alive for them instead of killing it on the spot. Back to our six-year-old girl. God made my baby brother. No, he didn't. Your mommy and daddy did. New character, six-year-old's mom. Now she's really mad. <laughs> mom comes along and says, and put yourself in the place of mom. Okay, pretend the Bible is the six-year-old girl, and the scientist is the critic, and you're the mom. You're going you're gonna, to you're gonna step in now to defend it. You're going you're gonna to try to make it something it's not because you want to protect it. Trust her. She watches Baby Einstein. She's smart. You can believe her. The scientist comes back because you've just played in, you've, you've just accepted the game. 
Well, I guess she missed the episode on where babies come from. He leaves thinking, boy, I nailed her. I nailed them both. I'm going to expose them both to my colleagues now. When the whole debate is just nonsense. But by stepping to the plate, you allowed the antagonist to frame the discussion. And I'm, I'm challenging you to not do that. And here's why. We're going to talk about Israelite worldview tonight. And I'm going to suggest that you're dealing with ancient people and ancient thinking. And here's a proposition for you. If the material of Genesis is incomprehensible to its original audience, in other words, if it's really a science book that's capable of articulating science the way we know it today, if that's really what Genesis is about, then it's, it's not revelation because it would be completely incomprehensible to its original audience because God didn't bother to give them all 21st century brains. Examples. Now, Proverbs 23, 16, I have here, seed of thought and emotions, the kidneys or the intestines. And I want to show you something. I don't have, this particular laptop doesn't have my software on it, so I'm kind of stuck. Don't report me, Bradley. <laughs> And I needed an interlinear, so I'm not using Biblia. <laughs> if it has an interlinear, please let me know. Proverbs 23, 16 here. Let's scroll a little bit. It's a little awkward here. <clears throat> this is King James. Yea, my reins, again, that's the word for kidneys in ESV or you know, other translations, shall rejoice when thy lips speak right things. Now, the word for reins or kidneys is... Kalyotav. If I actually clicked on that, I want you to just see one thing here. I'm not going to kill you with screenshots here. This is the word that elsewhere is translated plainly as kidneys. This is the word for the thing out of the, out of the carcass of the sacrifice that you take out and burn. Okay, kidneys. It's the same word. So... Again, we have, there, there are lots of verses like this. You could just do a search on it. Is it scientific to say that your kidneys are the seat and thought of emotions? Well, no, it's not. And I've said before, again, that there's, there's no word for brain in Hebrew, the Hebrew Bible. They, they don't have any idea what the brain does. You know, it, it's pre-scientific. Here's another one. This one's kind of odd, you might think, but it's really interesting. I'm not, I won't go there. I'll just rehearse the passage for you since you're no doubt familiar with it. Human persons existing within one parent. Now, I believe that human life, personhood, begins at conception or fertilization. Okay, when the daddy part hits the mommy part and we have fertilization, that is the beginning of a person, a human being. Prior to that moment, no persons can exist in just one person, and especially they can't exist in the male. But that's precisely what Hebrews 7 says. This is the passage where it talks about Levi paying tithes to Melchizedek while still being in the loins of his father. You know, I'm, I'm sorry, but scientifically speaking, Levi, the person, the individual, was not in the loins of his father. Okay, unless you want to believe, you know, like, and there's even problems with this, you know, Eastern thinking that there's just so many souls out there and they're floating around waiting for bodies. The problem with that is in the Hebrew mind, a person is what? A person is the union of material and immaterial, the fusing of, for lack of a better term, body and soul. That is a person. You can't have a person, you know, in the way we're used to the terrestrial experience that we call life, works. Now, even if we want to separate that and argue about it, the idea that you have a person inside of a male prior to conception just doesn't work scientifically. But that was a common view. Now, we know if we go, go to Hebrews 7, we know what the claim is. He's just claiming that, look, any descendant from Abraham 
who paid tithes to Melchizedek. And, and you know, all of those descendants, even Levi, the Levites, that priestly line is inferior to who? Jesus. Because Jesus is a high priest after the order of Melchizedek, okay, who was the superior in that situation. That, that's all they're saying. But if we want to press science into it, we have a problem. This one's a little weirder. Uh, 1 Corinthians 11 is very famous, the head covering passage. There's a good case to be made. If you actually knew some Greek and you wanted the file to this, I'll send it to you. There's actually a good case to be made that the whole issue in 1 Corinthians 11 is the ancient belief that you can find in Greek medical texts that the length of a woman's hair had something to do with fertility. It doesn't, okay? We know it doesn't, but they thought that there was an association there. Okay, some of the same terminology in that passage is found in Greek medical texts. The one I want to camp on is this one, Old Testament cosmology, because it relates to Genesis. The Old Testament shares terms and ideas with the ancient Near Eastern pagans. Again, we've, we talked a little bit about this last week. This should not be a surprise because there are similarities between the conception of how the world that we experience was made that are shared with Israel's neighbors. We see these terms as metaphorical, the terms that I'm going to cover tonight. We, we look at them, you know, when the Old Testament says something like that the sky is supported by pillars. Oh, that's just metaphorical. It's just poetic. To us it is, and you know why? Because we have a scientific worldview. That's why. They didn't. They were serious. No ancient person ever scaled a mountain. Do you realize that? like the tall mountains, because it takes oxygen, they freeze, I mean, all this kind of special equipment. There's no record that any of them ever did it. Okay, until the fifth, it wasn't until the 15th century that we have you know, the whole issue resolved of, can you sail this way and come out the other? You know, the, the whole idea about the earth being a globe and all that kind of stuff, that, that was debated up into the 15th, you know, 15th century. We look at that and go, oh, you know, it's just poetic. It is to us. But what I'm going to say is, again, back to my introduction, if you take it literally, you have to give them the benefit of the doubt. They were serious about it. All these concepts and even some of the terms are part of ancient Near Eastern cosmology. In other words, what I'll show you tonight, the division of the world, what the world looks like in Israelite cosmology, you'll, you can find the same descriptions anywhere else. Egypt, Mesopotamia, you know, ancient Syria, the Hittites, whatever. Because this was a common worldview. Now, if we say that Israel knew better through special divine revelation, then we have a problem. Then we have to say that the literature of the pagans, I mean, somehow they knew too. Did God speak to them? Where'd they get that information? I really don't want pagan literature to be in any way even looking inspired. Okay, I, that's just a... That opens a real, real can of worms for inspiration. It's just ground we need to stay away from, and for good reason. It's legitimate to stay away from it. If we let the Bible be what it is, though, we can claim it's unique theologically in what it says about God. But if not, then pagan literature is essentially on the same level. And trust me, you don't want to go there. You want it to be unique. Let's get into it here. Exodus 24. Israelite cosmology has three tiers. This is the Ten Commandments passage. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Three levels. New Testament is the same. Philippians 2.8, verse 10. So that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. What, like the worms? No. no we're, we're going to see what they were thinking here. Revelation 5, heaven, earth, under the earth. It's a three-tiered cosmology. This is what it would look like. I didn't make this graphic, which is why it looks cool. Okay. Somebody gave this to me because they hated, honestly, at Western. Uh, they, they hated the one I used, and so they gave me this one. 
This is a three-tiered cosmology. Here's God. We're going to see it in the verses. I'll show you that God lives above the vault of heaven, the firmament. And in the firmament, you have windows and doors. And you have the earth. We're going to see verses that talk about the ends of the round, flat earth here. Underneath is Sheol. Sheol can be both the grave and it can also be the underworld. Okay? It's, it's not quite hell, but it's sort of like hell. We can talk a little bit about it. And then underneath that, we have the great deep. These are all scriptural terms that are on this map. This is what an Israelite, an, Egypt, an Egyptian would have had different terms, but the same three-tiered level, same with the Mesopotamians. Now, they have, theologically, they have dramatically different views of what's going on here. Not just who made it, but what's going on. Views of afterlife, the value of humanity. I mean, it's, it's dramatically different. And I've made the comment before, Genesis is about theological messaging. And there are some dramatic differences in what Israel is saying, the Bible is saying, and anything else. So let's take a look at the parts. Waters above and below the heavens. Genesis 1.6, God said, let there be an expanse. Some translations have firmament. It's rakiah in Hebrew. In the midst of the waters. And let it separate the waters from the waters. And God made the expanse, the rakiah, and separated the waters that were under the expanse from the waters that were above the expanse. And it was so. And what was that expanse called? Heaven. The heavens, the sky, Shemayim in Hebrew. So you have here sky, okay, and you have waters above the sky, and of course you've got waters below down here, but then you have you know, the atmospheric heavens as well. Psalm 148 mentions the waters that are above the heavens. That's after the flood. Did you catch that? Because a lot of people want to say, oh, the waters above, they went away with the flood. See, the, 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 the firm room was this canopy thing, and it was there, and then the flood, it just went away. And... No. It wasn't. According to the psalmist, it's, he's still referring to it. Proverbs 8. When he established the heavens, I was there. When he drew a circle on the face of the deep. Isn't that interesting? We'll get to that circle on the face of the deep. When he made firm the skies above. Made firm is amats in Hebrew. It is the same verb for letting a tree grow firm, hard. Ancient cosmology across the board believed that the sky was this dome over the earth and it was solid. Kind of like the Truman Show. Okay. They believed that the stars were affixed to it. Some of the stars never moved, but other ones did. And the ones that did, this is why... The word stars is attributed to the sons of God and to angels in biblical literature. They believed that the stars were animate beings, that they were really divine beings, and then they'd come to earth as angels, but they, were, they lived up there. And those were the ones that moved. Why? Because movement shows what? If something moves, it's alive. Okay? Again, they can't take a rocket and go up and check it out. They, they believe that this is their... their there's a solid expanse over them. Another passage. Job 37, verse 18. Can you, like him, you know, speaking of Job, you know, drawing the dramatically poor comparison of God and Job, of course we know who's going to win there, but can you, like him, spread out the skies hard, kazakh, hard as cast metal, mutsak, as a metal mirror, mutsak, is the same word used in the casting of the laver, you know, the tabernacle where they would wash. It's solid. It's also the same terminology used for flint rock. Again, these passages point to the belief that there's a dome, the sky's a dome, and it's solid. And God lives above it, we live below it. Job 22, did I skip one? Did I No, I didn't. <clears throat> but you say, what does God know? Can he judge through the deep darkness? Thick clouds veil him so that he does not see, and he walks on the vault of heaven. That's where God lives. 
It's his address. You know, and b- before we, we think, oh, that's quaint, how cute. We think that, don't we? If a little child would ask you, where does God live? Up there. Is there something wrong with that answer? I don't think there's anything wrong with it. Use it, you know. Uh, Because there's a sense that God lives off planet. Why? Because he created the earth for us. He doesn't need it. He's independent of it. He transcends it. That's all it is. It's very normal. Amos 9, 6, he builds his upper chambers in the heavens and founds his vault upon the earth. The vault upon the earth. Who calls for the waters of the sea and pours them out in the surface of the earth. The Lord is his name. And Psalm 29, Lord sits enthroned over the flood. <clears throat> Let's go back here. If we talk about the middle tier now, the earth. Here's a God's eye view of the world. If God is sitting above the firmament and looking down at it, what does he see? This is where we get Genesis 1.9. God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place. Waters, plural, one place. How can you get all the waters in one place and then still call them seas? And the dry land appeared. (coughs) That's how you get it. All the waters, one place, earth, but there's still seas. Again, depending on what direction you're coming from or where you're at. Because if you're over here, you're going to call this something sea, and you can't really see what's going on over here. So if you live on the other side, that's another sea. But you got all the seas together. Proverbs 8, when he established the heavens, I was there when he drew a circle on the face of the deep. Circular. He made firm the skies above, so on and so forth. Here's an interesting one. He has inscribed a circle on the face of the waters at the boundary between light and darkness. What's the boundary between light and darkness? Think about it. You all know the answer to this. What's the boundary Think literally. What's the boundary between light and darkness? Does it get dark here? Does it get light here? Where's the boundary? The horizon. That's the boundary between light and darkness. If this is your view of the world, Your horizon is right here. That's where the firmament ends and it meets. It's stopping the waters from going any further. And it goes all the way around, the whole thing. Because if you're on a circular earth, everywhere you look, there's a horizon. The place where light and dark meet. Again, I told you I'm going to be a flaming literalist tonight. I'm going to say that I'm going to take them absolutely at their word. Vault of the heavens, pillars and mountains. The pillars of heaven tremble and are astounded at his rebuke. Oh, that's just metaphor and poetry. Yeah, to us it is. If you ask them, it's like, well, there's that, that, that big mountain thing. I mean, that's like, that's holding up the sky. Duh. If you don't believe it, go find I mean, <laughs> how are you going to find out any different? You know, obviously we can, but, you know, the means to do that isn't with them. Second Samuel 28, the earth reeled and rocked. The foundations of the heavens trembled and quaked because God was angry. Windows and doors. On that day, all the fountains of the great deep burst forth, and the windows of the heavens were opened. The fountains of the deep and the windows of the heavens were closed. Psalm 78, yet he commanded the skies above and opened the doors of heaven. Again, familiar phrases. Pillars under the earth, supporting the earth. Again, look at the language. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's, and on them he has set the world. You betcha. It's not Marduk. It's not that silly Ta in Egypt. It's Yahweh who did that. Isn't that amazing? 
I mean, an Israelite would want you to marvel. He would think you're insane if you didn't. Either that or a pagan. Job 38.4, where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? On what were its bases sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone? He set the earth on its foundations so that it should never be moved. To him who spread out the earth above the waters. Again, think of the circle with the, the earth in the middle. For his steadfast love endures forever. Sheol. The last level. Sheol is a Hebrew word. In the ESV, uh, I think in most cases they just have Sheol. It's Sheol in Hebrew. It can mean the hole that they just dug to put you in when you're dead. Or it can mean the underworld. Okay. I, I said the very first week, you know, we have this idea that hell, the underworld, is down there. Where do we get that? We get that from the Old Testament. Okay, that's, that's just... Do you think hell has a latitude and a longitude? Does it have an address? I mean, could you, could you put it into your GPS and it would take you there? I mean, it just... It doesn't have latitude and longitude. These are, these are what are called cosmic geographical terms. Heaven is where God is. It doesn't have a latitude and a longitude. But if you try to describe it, you're forced, because you live and you're limited by space and time, you're forced to use geographical language. Over there, up there, down here. You know, he passed over. Over what? Like, would I stumble on it if I came across? I mean, you know, we we use this language today. And we're forced to because we are not inhabitants of a non-physical reality. We're trapped into using this language about a place that doesn't have locality that our bodies can identify with. That's why we need new bodies, different bodies. Because if it's this one, we ain't getting there. Right? Just, you know, they're, they're, we're just trapped. This is our existence. And they have the same problem in the Old Testament. Job 26.5, the dead, the word is rephaim, tremble under the waters. The rephaim were not so nice inhabitants of the, the underworld. Tremble under the waters. Sheol is under the waters. Sheol is naked before God and Abaddon has no covering. Abaddon is another word. And we, that word comes up in Revelation for the destroyer, the pit. Okay. Sheol beneath is stirred up to meet you when you come. It rouses the shades, the Rephaim, to greet you, all who were leaders of the earth. It raises f- from their thrones all who were kings of the nations. Everyone righteous or wicked goes to Sheol. Everybody dies. Psalm 89, what man can live and never see death? Who can deliver his soul from the power of Sheol? Answer, nobody. Now the righteous went to Sheol. The hope of the righteous in the Old Testament was that they get to leave at some point to be with the Lord. Jacob goes there. I shall go down to Sheol to my son mourning. Hezekiah goes there, I'm consigned to the gates of Sheol for the rest of my years. See, when you went to Sheol, you were still alive. You were dead, but you're alive. You know, kind of like we think today, when people die, they're still alive. You know, we use the same language because that's the language of Scripture. You still exist beyond your physical death. You're still alive, but you're there, you know, some direction. Okay? Hezekiah is saying the same thing. David, certainly... I think he's going to be uh, in heaven, but he goes to Sheol. Cords of Sheol entangled me, snares of death. You know, are you going to praise, anybody going to praise you in Sheol? The cords of Sheol entangled me. The wicked also go there. They spend their days in prosperity and in peace. They go down to Sheol. Job's kind of ticked about that. They say to God, depart from us. We don't desire the knowledge of your ways. What's the Almighty and why should we serve him? What profit do we get if we pray to him? They're obviously unbelievers, but they go to Sheol too. 
Everybody goes to Sheol. The hope is that you get out. Now, that is a very brief overview of Old Testament cosmology. And I'm coming back to this slide, but I think I'd kind of like to go back to, well, some of, some of us won't have the context for it. Let's just end here. There is a passage, uh, if any of you bring it up in Q&A, I have more slides uh, about it, but I'm going to end here, that relates to cosmology that might have popped in your head as far as a question, um, dealing with the Earth's shape as it will. But the message I want you to take away again is Genesis is about theological messaging. Just like with our illustration, we spent a long time leading up to the cosmology slides, the conversation between the six-year-old and the scientist. When you accept the way that the critic frames the debate, you're not going to get very far. If you remember the conversation, the six-year-old, God made my baby brother. And the scientist says, no, he didn't. Your mommy and daddy did. I asked you who was right. And we said, they're both right. Then I asked you who was wrong. And we said, they're both wrong. <laughs> but we can parse that because we separate mentally the truth claim, the message, the assertion, the truth assertion being put out. And we immediately contextualize the person's worldview. And even if it's flawed like the six-year-old's was, her point is still correct. And if we look at Genesis this way, it doesn't matter that Genesis is, and the rest of the Bible is littered with this kind of cosmological language because God didn't bother to change the culture. He could have if he wanted to. He didn't care. If he had cared, he would have done it. The only other conclusion is that he couldn't, and then you have a problem with omnipotence. God doesn't care. I'm coming to these people at this time, in this place, they're, it's second millennium BC. They don't know it's BC yet because Jesus doesn't come. But it's a long time, okay, way, 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 way back. And I'm going to give them a message, and they're going to do the best they can under my influence to express it. I'm going to watch as they write. If they goof up, I'm going to send somebody along. Yeah, go fix that. You know, they didn't quite get it right. Somebody will come along and clean that up a little bit. When it gets done with the process, God can look at this thing we call the Bible and say, Good job. It's pretty good. I'm satisfied with that. But all of that content is fixed in a particular worldview that we don't have. Okay, we have to let it be what it is. And let God, let God's decision to do it that way settle with us. And my challenge to you is try it. <laughs> okay, if you do that, you don't need to justify it to science. They need to justify why they're criticizing it for not being what it was never intended to be. And that would be an interesting conversation. Don't accept that the way they articulate the debate. So if you have any questions, we can jump into that. I really have no idea what time it is. Oh, not bad, because we started late. So that was about an hour. Anybody have any questions? Yes. No, you cannot play that thing again. <laughs> Purgatory? Yeah, the idea of, of temporary purgation or punishment, it, it is where it comes from. This sort of holding tank, holding place. Now, the, the, the difference is you're not going to see... Catholicism gets the basic idea from this, but what you're not going to see in the Old Testament is the idea that when you're in Sheol, you are being punished a certain amount, and then when you cross the line, you're out. Okay, That's Catholic doctrine, but you won't find that in the Old Testament. The idea was everybody goes to Sheol. We put you in the ground... 
again, think of what we do today. We, we, we bury the dead, and we have this conception today because of the New Testament that if they're a believer, they're already with the Lord, and if they're not, you know, they're in hell. <clears throat> the Old Testament doesn't quite articulate it that firmly. Their idea was we, we bury them. They're in the ground. We know because we watched, we watched them put you there, put that person there. But now somehow, if we go back here to the picture, Sheol was, was conceived as being connected to the ground. Eventually, you're, that person that we put in the ground winds up going down there. And if they were righteous, the hope was, like the psalmist says, you know, someday I will see you know, the Lord, or I will walk with him, or like Job, I will see my Redeemer face to face. They didn't really know when that was going to happen. But if you were righteous, if you believed in the God of Israel, you, you, that was your faith. You believed that I am not going to stay here. I am going to be with the Lord because I walk with God. I, I, I you know, put my faith in the God of Israel. So the Old Testament lacks things like timing and real full description that you actually get in the New Testament. But the, the ideas, the places are, are the same. It's not, there are differences, but they're not dramatic. But Catholicism adds to it to get the idea of earning merit through pur purgation. You don't have that in the Old Testament. Yes? How does Jesus' parable of Lazarus and the rich man apply to that something separate from the Old Testament? <clears throat> it, I, I would not use the word separate. I would use the word... Um, more detailed. What, what, what you see is when you, when you have the Old Testament, at a given point, the Old Testament period ends. And then naturally, people within Judaism are doing what we do. They're writing about their Bible, like producing commentaries and things like that. And a lot of that literature speculates on, like, what, what's the place like? What goes on down there? You know, and, and eventually you get you get fuller descriptions, you get more details, you get persons on either side. You know, like there's the side that, you know, in Sheol that, you know, Abraham can, can sort of look at, at where it is. He's safe, but he can look down, you know, look over into this place. And it, in that particular instance, there's a very clear idea of fiery punishment. There's only one you don't really get fiery punishment in the Old Testament. What you do get, though, is Sheol was a fearful place because of who was there. And there are some sinister characters there. It, it, it's, it's described as watery. There, there's, one, there's one passage it talks about. It mentions flame, but the question is whether it's, whether it's like a burning place or not. But there are demonic, bad entities there. It's a fearful place to be. So it's, it's definitely cast as the place that God isn't and that the bad things are, but you don't get the full descriptions of punishment. You get that on into the intertestamental period, and then the New Testament is very consistent with that. So you actually have I'm going to use the double D word, doctrinal development, okay, for the doctrine of the afterlife. And before that scares you, all doctrines develop. Okay, I, I challenge you to find a doctrine, a biblical doctrine, that isn't different in some way between the Testaments. They're never exactly the same. They... They progress. We believe in something called progressive revelation. You say, well, those books in the middle, those intertestamental books, you know, they're not part of revelation. No, they're not. But the writers on either side, especially the New Testament writers, they're reading these. Okay? They, they quote some of them in the New Testament. New Testament quotes some non-canonical sources to make a theological point because they're thinking about what they're doing. Now, in the doctrine of inspiration, we say that God was fine with that. God providentially said, oh, you want to quote that? Fine. It, it helps. Yeah, you're right. It, it's a good illustration. You know, it, you, have to, you have to view what's going on in, in a very providential sense. I, I think you're getting the feel 
When it comes to inspiration, I'm just going to say this. <clears throat> we think of inspiration often wrongly. We think of it as an event. Prophet gets up, starts making eggs for breakfast. You know, his mind blanks out and his hand starts to move. And he, he's not conscious of this at all. He wakes up and goes, wow, that's pretty cool. You know, I didn't know I could do that. That is not inspiration. Inspiration ought to be viewed more like canonicity. A long, providentially guided process that took as long as God wanted it to take. And in the end, God looked at it and said, good job, thumbs up, you got it. Okay, it's not zapping, all right? It's not automatic writing like it's a paranormal experience, okay? It's a long, a long developing process where God is in the process. He was in the process before the writer was even born. He's preparing the environment into which that writer will be born. He's preparing the parents. He's preparing the education. He's preparing everything about that guy or that collection of guys ahead of time. He sees all that because at the end of the trail, God wants to look at it and say, you got it. Now, from this point on, just start copying it. No changes. We're done. Just copy the thing now. And then again, that sets up you know, its, own, its own set of circumstances. You know, we, we have to get away from this cartoonish idea of inspiration. And doctrinal development is one of those. God says, yeah, you know, there's an afterlife. I'm going to tell you a little bit about it. Come on, psalmist, you know, cough it up, start writing. He writes down, again, what he understands of it. God says, okay, that'll do. Good enough for now. Time goes on. We're out of the Old Testament period. You've got a lot of Jewish writers speculating on things. New Testament period comes along. Peter wants to write something about the underworld or the afterlife. And he happened to read five years ago this book by Philo over here. And God says, you know, that was a pretty good book by Philo. I mean, I didn't really tell him to write it, but it was a good book. You know, why don't, why don't you remember that page? And when you remember that page, put that in. That's a good line. And Peter puts it in. Good job. That'll be clear. Because the whole idea is communication. It's not producing some paranormal artifact. The idea is communication. People under God's hand doing the task, producing something to be preserved for posterity. That's all it is. It's a very, you, know, under, you understand when I say that, it's a very human thing. But God is in the process. I don't know why we need God to zap people. I mean, I just don't get it. You know, I say that, and I know people living today need zaps. Because they know, honestly, they, they feel like they, they're not walking with God unless they get zapped. I'm not going to name any names. But you know what I'm talking about. Okay. God can't be real unless I'm zapped. Well, actually, he can. If you think a little bigger, he can. I, I, I went, sorry for that rabbit trail, but any other questions? That, that's a hobby horse of mine. I think you can tell, but Yes. Oh, is, is that a good one? You know, I, <clears throat> that, that's, that's a fairly difficult question because on the one hand, you know, I'm, I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt. That it, 
their heart's in the right place. You, you know, I mean, it's easy to understand that, that you know, the enemy so, isn't so much Darwin. It, it's really how Darwin is used. Uh, because I, I, you know, I know plenty of Christians that could really care less about Darwin because, okay, if evolution's the right, big deal. That's how God did it. What's the next topic? I mean, it's literally like that. And for them, the issue is the evil in Darwinism is the way it's used to not only divorce creation from God, but to kill God. So in view of that, that that is so prevalent today, if somebody wants to fight Darwinism, you know, and, and that's what's in their crosshairs, you know, I'm, I'm glad you're opposed to that. I'm opposed to it, too. I, I'm wary of it for the reasons that we've we've been talking about the last couple of weeks. So, on matters like this, I have to give people the benefit of the doubt because I can't get into their heads. If if they really feel led by God to do that work and to give to that work and to and to be involved in that, I'm going to let them go. Just you know, Lord bless you. Uh, what I want from you is for you to understand why I'm not. But I'm still on the same page. I mean, I, I, I still agree with your goal. And I'm your ally. If you want to look at me as the loyal opposition, you can. I mean, I don't, I, I'm no fan of evolution. I, I frankly have a hard time even caring about it, to be honest with you. And I think you can sort of tell why. Um, <clears throat> but I, I would let them know that I'm, I'm friend, not foe. And if they're going to shoot at me for not being more friendly and not being militant, oh, wow. Well, and trust me, I do get shot at <laughs> uh, for that. But, you know, I, I, I would never try to judge what someone feels is the Lord's work and sit in judgment on that and say that's not the Lord's work. You know, I would, I would hope that they would they would mature in ways that would just let us um, be at our respective places. I don't know if that helps, but that's just, you know, where I'm at on that. Anybody else? Okay, I, I thought you were going to drift into somewhere else. And I, I'm, I'm not going to open a can of worms here because we need to go. But, uh, but I'm going to yield to temptation a little bit. Go home. <laughs> Read Romans one twenty, and then read Romans ten eighteen, and then look in, your, in the cross reference in the margin of Romans ten eighteen. Paul is quoting Psalm nineteen verse four, and then ask yourself, what is he thinking? That'll entertain you for a moment.